what I want to do now is just talk a little bit more, um, more specifically about handheld spectrometers and what we can do with that data, and a little bit about the history. So uh, I've popped up here the uh, uh, hype cycle for spectral geology as, as, as I see it. Um, the, there we go. So the technology trigger really was the PIMA. So this is for handheld spectrometry as used in the mineral exploration industry. So the PIMA really was a triggering technology uh, to actually get people thinking about what they could potentially do with this technology at the core shed, in the field, um, and in the mine. And from that developed then the um, development of, of TSG, the TSG software for interpreting the spectral data, and the TerraSpecs came out after the PIMA. The advantage of the TerraSpec was that you've got a much wider wavelength range. The PIMA only measures in the short wave infrared, whereas the TerraSpec covers the visible and the infrared as well. Um, and then, of course, the, the Hilogger systems were developed following that. So there was this, uh, P, this, this climb of, of excitement and, uh, um, and um, interest in the technology. But uh, so we reached a peak round about when the Hilogger came out. Um, and uh, then it, basically what happened was, um, I'll just go to here, there was a fair bit of disillusionment because of uh, various issues with regard to poor data quality, um, the problems with interpreting the data, so people would actually struggle with becoming spectral experts in order to interpret the data. So even with software like TSG, it still requires quite a degree of expertise to be able to do much with these data. And so it was, it was relatively slow to actually do the processing uh, mm -hmm. to get the information that people need. And one of the key things nowadays um, is uh, standardization as well, because all data is going into company databases, so it's really important to have these data in a standardized format. And when they're coming from different spectrometers and different individuals, uh, so different computers, obviously um, it, it is non-standard and, and somewhat subjective, so um, that was also an, a major issue. And what we found as well is that um, you know, I spent many years training people. I, d I ran a two-day training workshop, um, and I would teach people how to use uh, the software, how to interpret the spectra, what the data mean, and all this. Um, but still, you know, you go away from that time, and, and uh, people still have to then become those experts to be able to do the interpretation. So, but, but what people really wanted was the mineral data that is in the spectral data, not necessarily have to look at each individual spectrum. So, uh, yeah, so that actually took us into that trough of disillusionment for this, uh, the hype cycle. Um, but I feel over the last, the last 10 years, really what's taking us out of it is the, the advent of core imaging. So those guys have actually started to create a way of delivering data, delivering results from this technology to make it more accessible to people. Uh, and in the last five years, we, we've, um, my company's developed a, a system called Osiris which uh, also works on handheld spectral data, and this is where we're actually taking the, uh, the spectral data and providing mineral information to the end user, so people can actually start to focus on what they do best, which is geology, obviously, and geochemistry. So hopefully we're, we're well on the way to the plateau of productivity with this particular technology, and, uh, but I see it more and more as becoming uh, more routine. Our approach with interpreting the data has been to go to machine learning. So um, we've got a, a data set of real world spectra from um, geological settings globally. Um, and um, these are interpreted at a, at a very detailed level with uh, five, six, sometimes um, more uh, minerals being identified in the spectra. And so basically this data set has been individually interpreted, each one of the spectra in that million spectral data set and more uh, has been interpreted at the ex spectral expert level. And um, based on using know-how and spectral libraries that we have uh, and, and developed that training set, which has gone into our machine learning system. Um, and then the machine, this, that training set then has taught our machine learning system, how to interpret the spectra, uh, and then out of that comes uh, the mineral results. So uh, this is our, our approach with machine learning. And uh, that's what's gone into our Asiris system. Asiris, or iSiris, 
I, I'm not too bothered how you pronounce it, um, is uh, short for uh, infrared AI, Spectral Infrared Interpretation System. And uh, as I was saying, it's a machine learning system with a very large training data set of real world spectra. So we haven't looked at any museum, pure mineral spectra. These are actually spectra all, with all the problems, the artifacts and, and the human issues around measuring spectra uh, have gone into the data set. So it's pretty robust for most conditions. <clears throat> aiming f when what we're aiming for with it is intelligent interpretation of the infrared spectra. And uh, the focus also has been on creating the standardized output. So the, the output is always the same, whether you're looking at a bunch of spectra from South America or from Australia. Uh, and this is just a, a, some strip logs of um, some of the results that we can get out of the data. So basically the way it works is uh, the spectra come in. We've got a QAQC um, algorithm in the Sirius desktop, which allows you to do QA on the spectra as you're measuring them. Um, and so that satisfies that quality issue. And uh, then the spectra get imported into the local computer and then uploaded into the cloud where they get processed. Uh, we do, uh, there's a human element that does a QA on the, uh, the, the results, so it's not entirely automated, so we are overseeing the data. And then the results are then stored in the cloud and they're ready for any anybody within that company that has permissions for the project to download the spectra um, to their copy of a Sirius desktop. So and we've also just put in a few visualization tools uh, into the software. The thing about the, uh, we're not trying to redo any other uh, plotting programs, we're just trying to make it easy for people to visualize their results. Mm -hmm. So um, the data are easily transportable into other packages such as IOGAS or LeapFrog for modeling and uh, integration with geochemistry. So the aim really with developing the system was to make this a useful technology for people and, and that's been the feedback that I've had over the last 20 years is that you know this is great but you know so that we were just trying to get past that but. Um, we want to get geologists thinking in terms of mineralogy instead of spectra. So as an example People who use PXRF, they don't talk about the XRF spectra, they talk about the elements that they're detecting. Uh, in XRD, you're not looking at XRD traces, you're actually getting the mineral information. So uh, really we want the infrared spectra to be looked at in the same way and to be as widely used as the portable XRF. So uh, yeah, making easy to make get mineralogy. So we've, uh, yeah, we've got good hardware nowadays, so we've got a nice tick there, tick for the interpretation, but um, there's still a few issues around sampling practices, so uh, it's a focus on that we have really is to educate people on collecting better quality spectra, because um, there is a knack to it. Um, selecting the right sample type and then being able to do the right QAQC as you're measuring. How am I doing for time, Helen? Still? I'm good? Okay, great. Uh, it's similar to the, the problems that we have with collecting good quality core tray pictures. You know, that's sort of been a, an issue over, over years, as, as I'm sure you know, that um, you know, it's, as you go further back in history, the worse those photographs get, and the same with the spectra. So uh, you need proper use and care of the equipment, and uh, obviously a reliable operator to do the measurement. So just to give you a bit of information about the best sample types, um, I still feel that handheld spectrometry has got a lot of use, it's uh, seriously underutilized historically. Uh, we can still do really good analysis of just spot measurements on core surfaces. As long as this is uh, the program of work is well planned and systematic, you can still get good results. One of the best ways of using it though is uh, to look at um, the crushed material. So basically you're getting a homogenized sample. Uh, so the sample is, is crushed, ready for the geochemical analysis, and uh, then you get a split that goes to the TerraSpec and another split that goes for geochemical analysis and pulping. So generally, get the sample, the, the reject material before the powdering process. So when you powder, you do degrade the spectra somewhat. So if you can get to those reject crush material, um, that will give you the best sample. And then the, 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 the spectral data can, and mineralogy that you're extracting can be directly compared with your geochemical data. 
So how are people using it now? So yes, people are now starting to really appreciate the value in the, the data and the mineral information that they can get and uh, starting to learn those best practices which uh, we're, we're helping with. And there is this global standardization uh, of the data. So the spectral mineralogy data is going into databases now uh, and being used more widely. So we're, I think we're satisfying now those requirements of that easy mineralogy. So um, that, that really was where it all started, the, the desire for that and the early days. What we're producing now is information that goes down to quite a fine detailed level, especially with the better quality spectra. So we're detecting minerals that uh, may have been missed in the past. Um, and obviously the, the dominant mineral does not always tell you the, the, f the full story. So you do need to get down to those subtle responses sometimes to actually, uh, especially in porphyry systems when you're trying to look at that uh, overprinting history. So I've got a couple of quick case studies. Um, so spectral mineralogy where it's augmenting geochemistry. So we have a soil survey uh, in Europe where um, this was over a known um, epithermal system. And so these are just a, a bunch of um, geochemical results. So we've got the, the epithermal system sits over here. Uh, so we've got some um, geochemical responses associated with that. But then we've got something lighting up over to the east of the project uh, where we're getting some bismuth and, and, um, and molly. So that's the molly, the molly plot and bismuth indicating that there's something happening over to that part of the project. And when we look at the mineralogy, uh, we've got minerals like um, the um, pro like prophylite and alunite um, showing distributions. There's a lot of alunite over in this part of the, the project area. Um, and then when you look at the alunite type, you can see we've got an alunite response above that um, the molly bismuth um, anomalies. And we're getting a higher temperature alunite, a sodic alunite occurring there as well. So this was indicating to the company, to El Eldorado, who were uh, doing this, this um, survey, that uh, it's possible they might have a porphyry system underlying um, this in this project, part of the project area. And the Alpala deposit in, in, uh, in Ecuador that's being, mined, uh, being explored at the moment by Sol Gold. These guys are doing fantastic uh, analysis of uh, where they're They've got all their samples that are going in for geochemistry also getting terraspect. So they're getting geochemistry, spectral mineralogy, and then they have uh, really good geologists in the field logging um, the, their drill holes. So they've got a full rounded uh, analysis of their samples. And uh, so what they've basically have a, a detailed evolving alteration model that grows from week to week as they um, bring in all the analyses. Briefly about uh, spectral estimates, so we can also look at the uh, relative intensities of the absorption features and get a spectral contribution output. Uh, I'm going to speed up a little bit because I may run out of time, but um, <clears throat> so that spectral contribution or SC value gives you an idea of, of how much a mineral is contributing to the spectrum. <clears throat> and for example, Eldorado Gold have used this in their Kishadag mine in Turkey to map out the distribution of their minerals, their alteration minerals. So here is a, a leapfrog um, plot where we just did a slice through uh, a particular level in the, the deposit and uh, showing where the distribution of the kale night and the distribution of white mica over on the east part of uh, the area. And all this information can be put into the geotechnical analysis as well. So, uh, and then when we look in more detail about at the kaolinite -like crystallinity variation and the white mica crystallinity, these all seem to correlate quite nicely with some parts of, of the, the, the deposit that were quite friable, so uh, they correlated nicely with their independently analyzed geotechnical data. Uh, and the kaolinite -like crystallinity also correlated with some areas of uh, poor recovery that they were trying to understand. So the future, I think, is uh, interoperability, so being able to integrate this data with uh, other visualization packages and uh, with geochemistry, um, and also as another level of information to go into the machine learning, which is a growing uh, field in our industry. Uh, and of course, integration with the geochemistry is, is also key. 
um, to actually aim for that more quantitative mineral output. So uh, when we bring in the, the spectral mineralogy together with the uh, mineralogy derived from geochemistry, you can start to get the full picture of the minerals. Um, and uh, Scott Halley obviously is, is key in, in doing a lot of this um, in many different project areas. Okay, so um, what does it all mean? I'm just wrapping up here. The, uh, so I, I feel that handheld spectrometers really still remain the fastest and most cost-effective way of collecting uh, project-wide mineralogy. So um, you can get out there and, and measure thousands of spectra within a week and, and then get them analyzed within another week so, and modeled. So within a, a matter of, of, of a couple of weeks, you could actually hit, have your uh, alteration model. And new innovations for interpreting the data, such as a series, they open the way for these data to be properly utilized. And it means that um, these data are more accessible to the non-spectral expert. And uh, we, we're really seeing a revival uh, in the mineral exploration industry to actually uh, start to use these data. Um, and uh, yeah, they're also getting out there and buying new spectrometers. They're getting their spectrometers out of the cupboard and getting them to work again. So. Uh, where they've been sitting on the shelf. So really, uh, the future then, of course, um, is uh, hopefully the field geologist toolkit will include uh, a, a halo and uh, a an portable XRF, and of course, uh, the hammer and uh, a hand lens and a tough book. So there we go. <laughs> Thank you very much.